Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast. To join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice, head to xyadvisor.com. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a like. Clayton here with Brendan Moss. Uh, from the States. Actually, whereabouts in the States are you right now? So I, I'm in Texas at the moment uh, by way of California. Whoa, wh- what do you prefer? You know, honestly, Texas. It's, it's much more laid back, very chill. I know California gets that vibe, but California is very hustle and bustle. And Texas is just, uh, it, it's more like the, the West, mm. the, the West as opposed to the West Coast. Yeah. Okay. That makes, that makes sense. Cause obviously like from an Australian's point of view, both California and Texas have really strong identities. Uh, so I could imagine, you know, uh, enjoying both, uh, apparently LA in itself has the population of all of Australia of around 20 million. So I could imagine if our entire continent, which is the size of the continental U S uh, if our entire continent, is fit into the size of one city, then I'm guessing there's a lot of hustle and bustle and I'm guessing Texas is better. Whereabouts in Texas are you? So I'm in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Yeah, wow. Which, uh, which consequently we have direct flights into Sydney, which is nice. Yeah, man. Um, which actually, did you fly out of Dallas when you've come to Australia in the past? I did both. So flew flew out of uh, DFW airport and then LAX. And the the DFW flight is at the time it was the longest flight I believe either by miles or or hours or something. And so it was uh, it was pretty, it was a trip. That's for sure. Yeah, man. Being being in Australia, oh God, wherever we go to in the world, it is it's really painful. Really, really painful to uh, to jump on a plane. But um. Speaking of things that aren't so painful, uh, you, good sir, uh, have been consulting in financial services for a little while now. Uh, did you start out as an advisor? I did, yeah. Like, like a lot of folks, um, you know, just started. And fortunately, here in the States, we have uh, financial planning programs at uh, what you call, we call it college, you call it university. And um, yeah, it was fortunate to get with a good firm right out of the gate. And my story was, I, I worked in that firm for three to four years and the owner of the firm got uh, pancreatic cancer and died suddenly within two months. And so I was left as a 27 year old kid <laughs> really at Whoa. the time with the stewardship of a you know relatively large at the time independent financial planning firm. And so that, that was the, you know, you go to school to learn it, but then you learn via the school of hard knocks of, wow, I, I have this responsibility on my shoulders and uh, we've, we've got to learn how to, how, to, how to get this right quick. Wow. So goodness, I mean, you, you're out of college and then your boss dies and then you just take over the company. How many clients were there? Yeah, so we we had we were managing at the time. We had about a hundred, hundred and twenty families that that we served, and and around a hundred and sixty million in uh, assets that, yeah. that we managed. And at you know that's a big, it's a big responsibility at the time. But the you know, I had, they had given me a shot right out of the gate, out of school. And the widow came to me and said, look, I, I trust you to, to do what's right. And uh, she didn't give me the firm by any stretch, but sure, yeah. uh, we, we, we certainly then you know, made some strategic moves to solidify the A, that the clients would, would be served well and, and stayed and, and then B, uh, you know, we can move into the second half of the story, which was uh, I had a had a gentleman by the name of Joe Duran uh, come to our office one day, and uh, he had a crazy idea about a company called United Capital, and uh, we were the launch point of uh, of United Capital in in the states. 
And United Capital, um, that's a huge fund manager, right? So we, we were, so we, we functioned as a large national, here we call them registered investment advisors. So an, an independent uh, financial advisor, not associated with a, a broker dealer or, or, or things like that. And I know we're kind of, uh, we have a slightly different language, but uh, in, in, one of the largest independent financial planning firms in the country. Yeah, right. How many advisors? Oh, gosh. Um, well, you know, back then, me. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and just, I, I would say, gosh, right now, there's probably over 250 to 300. Yeah, that's pretty big. That's, uh, you know, as far as financial planning is concerned, that's really, really big. In fact, I think that's probably the, you know, beyond being associated with a product, I think that's probably the biggest independent financial planning practice I've ever heard of or company I've ever heard of. That's huge. Yeah, you know, we, it's, it's, been a, it's been an interesting ride through the, you know, probably the last 10, but, but really the last five years, we have seen some of these mega, mega firms, whether they've, you know, grown through acquisition or just grown organically, you know, I would say we probably have 20, maybe 30 firms, independent firms in the U.S. now with 15 to 20 billion that, that they manage. And this is what's great about it is it's all independent. And, and so you're not beholden to, you know, to a, a large company. I mean, these are, these are companies that have grown, uh, you know, from, from nothing essentially over the last 20 years. Yeah. Right. Um, when, cause in Australia, when we say independent, it basically just means no one can force you to use a product. So I guess for United Capital, they were using external third-party investment solutions and, and uh, retirement account solutions and not using the in-house ones. Was that, was, did it ever end up going down the path of creating its own product? So we, we always had strategies, you know, but, but I never considered those products. Those were, you know, we put together, a, you know, different portfolios using Vanguard or, or DFA or, or things like that. Um, now we that that firm now is a part of Goldman Sachs, and you know I think now we are seeing seeing some of that being created and and part of it, it it's interesting because you wanna you wanna remain independent mm. as as long as you can, but at the same time once you get that big you you kind of have to start creating things yeah because sometimes the the other stuff out there just doesn't work or you can you actually can do it more efficiently and, and cost effectively so it'll, it'll be interesting to see as some of these independent firms grow which which direction they they lean and go and and i'm not sure we can fault them either way yet yeah <laughs> but i'm sure the day will come where you know, they, they make some, some, you know, slip a little bit. Yeah. I, I mean, I've always been sort of 50, 50. It's, I, it always comes down to the individual advisor. I've seen uh, independent advisors simply just pick the investment um, options based around what pays the most uh, commission. And I've seen sort of what we would call aligned or an agent associated with a product that doesn't, it chooses not to use, the product for any of their clients. So uh, it always does come down, at least to my, my view, that a, um, a, an aligned or an independent advisor, that doesn't tell the whole story. It, it really just depends on the, the advisor. So I guess, you know, in the case of United Capital eventually creating their own product, I mean, it makes sense. I, I wouldn't imagine how you would get any bigger without eventually going down that path. And especially if you believe in, in the product, which I'm sure that they would. Um, I, from, from my, where I'm standing, I've got zero problem with people uh, creating product or companies creating pro product if it, attach, like, if it attracts an audience. So, and by that, I mean, like for the last, I don't know, 30 or 40 years, 
personal finance and, and personal investing has been uh, put your money in this thing and we'll tell you about the results of it whenever we want. Um, back in the day, it was very rarely. As we went through time you know, with, with technology, and now people have the chance to, to check it as often as possible. But realistically, there's only probably like this whole concept of engaging with your investments on a rational level, which don't get me wrong, is a great thing. But only half the population engage with things on a rational level anyway. So, you, so this whole concept of, um, you know, having more transparency and more reporting and like that's great for the people that like it but there's a whole chunk of society that do not engage with investments with their mind they engage in investments with you know for lack of a better term their heart and their emotions and so i'm really interested in seeing in the future uh products that appear that are that are robust that are well managed, that are low cost, that have great investment philosophies behind them. And yet none of that is spoken about and it's only packaged in a way that emotionally connects, connects with an audience because that entire audience, which is half the population, have been essentially completely ignored over the last 30, 40 years. Um, and so with United Capital creating product, that's awesome. Uh, I want to see other people out there creating products specifically for this ignored um, audience. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. And, and, you know, we're seeing more, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of that, the, like, as you said, technology is making more of this possible. And, and now you're seeing some of the product providers even come to, you know, come to the advice side of the table where the vanguards of the world are moving into financial yeah. planning. And I know sometimes that scares a lot of folks, but I, I view it as a good thing. Schwab doing, uh, you know, retainer-based financial planning is a good thing. We're, we're getting access. That means the, the grassroots where so much of, of what, you know, us and, and our, the listeners have been doing you know, now we're seeing big companies recognizing, okay, this is a better way. We need to figure out how to do this. And look, the reality is we, we can't serve everyone out there. And if they can help and if they can bring them to the table, that's, that's a positive for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it's like in the States here. Um, two thirds of the retirement funds are managed by financial planners. Um, so what's, kind of interesting is you see this uh, life cycle of a business where they say, you know, they go straight to the consumer, cut out the middleman, like, you know, reduce costs. And they'll, they'll attempt that message for, mm, I don't know, a couple of years, maybe until they run out of money. And then they go, Oh, actually, um, financial planners, they're definitely the, best and and we've seen like and this is startups but we've seen huge pivots over the last couple of years because at least here it's almost impossible to uh launch a company without the help of financial planners especially an investment style of product with vanguard um i mean they've just i've got so much respect for vanguard from um a marketing point of view i think just coming up with you know, uh, a pa like calling it passive when it was just a market weighted, you know, a market weighted top 100 or top 200 and trade in and out. And then the size compared to the overall, uh, you know, uh, market cap of the, of the top 200 uh, reflects in the portfolio I, is, is actually a strategy, but just it was so easy to code in a computer to make it, to make those trades that they called it passive and passive I think is the greatest uh, marketing word known to men. Thankfully, <laughs> thankfully uh, Vega just happens to uh, have a, a high quality, low cost product. So it hasn't ended in disaster by any means, but uh, man, I take my hat off to them for, for creating that in whole investment philosophy. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you're right. I mean, it's all, all Vanguard is is a product. You yeah, know? I mean, that's it. It is. It's just a product, right? Yeah, yeah. Um. Now, so as someone who was uh, financial planning, obviously took on a lot of responsibility early. 
Um, but your, uh, your journey overlapping with XY begins more on the consulting side of your career uh, and your work with uh, you know, Ray Jaramus, one of the co-founders here. At the time, he was working at Traystar. They do annual trips to the U.S., um, and you introduced or your company introduced them to financial life plan, financial life management. Yeah, yeah, we did. It, and it was something that, you know, we had, we had worked on for a long time. And, and frankly, you know, even though I'm not with United Capital any longer, uh, you know, it's just something that's spread. And that's, again, a, a great thing to spread the blending of, you know, not just your finances with your life, but how you make those decisions, the behaviors that are behind those decisions. And yeah, it was super cool to have the, the team from, from Trista or a few of them anyway, uh, come up and, and teach them. Uh, really, they were, they were at the leading edge of it. Probably one of our fourth or fifth uh, classes through uh, when we started teaching advisors through it. And it was a, it was so cool to to see that spread because at that point you you know I mean it, it can spread locally and you know even nationally but then you know when you start having folks from from Australia from Canada from the UK starting to to see and feel that message it's a, it's a look it's a cool feeling for sure but. Um, all it means is that that message is really resonating and, and that more than just financial planning, really integrating a holistic financial life management process to your practice, to your firm is, is just the way to go. Yeah. I, I sort of built this independently by myself at, at my own version of it before I'd heard what you guys were doing. Um, I have zero doubt that uh, the one that you guys were working on as a team was substantially better, but that whole idea of, um, you know, I end up writing a book called fund your ideal lifestyle. So this whole idea of money choices are life choices and life choices are money choices. And I think the terms like financial life management are really, really cool and sort of hit, where I see certainly, I wouldn't even say the future of advice anymore. I'd say the current day, the, the more progressive style of advice has certainly been up and running now for a handful of years and it's going remarkably well. Could you explain um, what your like succinct um, understanding of financial life management is? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question because it, it does tend to mean a lot of things to different people. It, it's, it's like the traditional, what is wealth management? Um, what is financial life management? It, it's, look, it's truly taking a, oh, I'm, I'm going to use the word holistic and I hate the word holistic, but it's, it's the word that, that probably makes the most sense. But, you know, it's a full life view of how and where does money intersect. Um, you know, I think Carl Richards, if I, I'm sure many of your listeners know Carl Richards, the, the sketch guy uh, from uh, the New York Times and the behavior gap, you know, it's his sketch of where money and life intersect. That's financial life management. I, I, I can't do it any better. So I'm going to give credit to Carl and just say that one sketch, it's where money in your life intersect. And it's finding the best way to make those decisions. It's telling the truth to your clients when they need to hear the truth, not just what they want to hear. It's, it's helping them and guiding them to not tell them what to do, but give them the information to make the decisions on their own so that they own it and they feel good about it. And that's, that's financial life management. It's, it's the intersection of life and money. Yeah. What, when you, when you come to, you know, when you're sitting in front of a client and you're thinking, well, how do I get this person to make better life decisions? What, what is, what is sort of a, a high level framework? Do you, I mean, or do you, do you promote a, a high level framework to help people make better decisions? Cause obviously like you can lead a, a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. So um, oftentimes when I was advising, I would 
get, you know, get someone to the point where they realized they needed to make a change. Um, but it was, it was sometimes difficult to sort of get them over the edge, so to speak. Do you work to a coaching framework or like, do you have any sort of tips or tricks that you would use in a meeting to get people to turn that realization into action? So there, there's a couple of things that I would suggest. And, and the first is getting really good and comfortable with asking lots of questions because it's, it's too easy to ask a client a question, a client gives you an answer and you're done with it. And there, there's a great, um, there was a great study. Uh, it was one of our, one of the big financial planning software companies here did a study around how many goals were in all of the plans across their platform. And, and that number, it was either like 2.1 or 2.3 goals, uh, which if that's all you have, like there's, that's not enough. It's not enough. It, you need to get at more, call it goals or, or call it whatever you want to call it, but getting to the questions of not just what, what you want, but why, you know, why, why is that? Why is that important? Well, this is why it's important. Well, drilling deeper into that and getting comfortable in those types of conversations is the best thing that you can do to get more out of the client to get a deeper connection that's going to help them make a decision in the long run. Now, that also means that you have to do a better job of preparing those clients for when you're going to have that conversation. And that's a, that's a fallacy that I see a lot now in our consulting days with, with Herbers and company is we don't give clients the proper expectations mm -hmm. and they may come to a meeting and they may sit down and, oh my gosh, we're, we're asking them to, you know, get financially naked. You hear that term sometimes and people are ready if they're prepared. And so sometimes you just have to take a little, little more. That's why we, you know, content is such a big part of the, the preparation of a meeting is, are, is the content, is the, what you're putting out there going to help that conversation when somebody gets to your door, when somebody gets to, uh, you know, sitting across the table from you or hopefully side by side you. And that just asking those questions is, is going to be a big part of that. The second piece is then having tools that you can use to reinforce that. And what I mean by those tools might be not, not tools around, not a Monte Carlo simulation, not a retirement projection, nothing like that. More of a, more of a check-in, more of a checklist of, hey, your goal was uh, we wanted to send the kids to school and pay, pay for the kids' school. How do you feel you're tracking towards that? I can show you with data. Yeah, it looks good with data, but how do you feel? And so those kinds of things help make a deeper connection. And if they don't feel like they're making progress or if they do feel like they're making progress, we know we're either on the right path or we're not. Yeah, that's a really good question. So in terms of how I think be, you get better at being an advisor is learning those, like learning, having a whole toolkit of, of questions. And that is a really, really good question. So I can like, how do you feel we're tracking to your goal? Um, Cause I can show you the data right here, but it's interest. That's a really, really, really good question, which is a whole other piece about financial planning because, you know, I came to it via accounting and, uh, and you think like you think as you're getting into advice, financial planning, you think it's going to be spreadsheets and, and, and financial statements. And it ends up being you're, you're getting, as you just use the term financially naked, you're, you're, 
there's this whole super vulnerable side of, of, of advice that's really hard to communicate, uh, like even to advisors. And when people walk into this industry, I t- <laughs> you talk about preparing someone, it's, it's very difficult to even prepare people that are walking in to becoming an advisor of what it means to be an advisor. And it takes, it takes a long time. I, and it's unfortunate that it takes a long time, but it kind of does where uh, you, you sort of learn things um, from people around you because I, I still remember my first ever meetings as a financial planner. And I was like absolutely terrified um, because I knew I was meant to do something. I wasn't quite sure, but then over the years you sort of pick up these good questions and yeah, like uh, that, that's a really good question. Um, in terms of Herbers now, so certainly um, I've never personally heard of it, but uh, you were saying before we got on that you've actually had a bit of traffic from Oz. So I'm kind of interested. Um, what is it that you're doing over there that's getting the attention of Australian advisors? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm not sure, but uh, we, so Angie Herbers, the founder of our company has, it's, it's an interesting story. So we, we actually met at university. Um, she went to a, a rival school of, of mine and we were in, uh, we have, uh, I mean, this is crazy. There, there are financial planning competitions in, in college and, and to, Long story short, she beats uh, her school, beats our school, and, and we kind of become yeah. very friendly rivals and, and have been for the last 20, 20 years or so. <laughs> and I would always give her a hard time uh, with, hey, Ange, your, your consulting firm is, it's, you guys grow and build firms better than anyone that I've ever seen, but you do it at a small scale and you need to, this needs to be getting out. You need to be preaching this from the mountaintops. And uh, I, I had left United Capital. I was currently with uh, XY Financial Planning, the, the US XY. Woo. And and she, you know, I got a, got a call from her and she said, hey, you know how you've been, been ragging on me about, uh, you know, getting bigger. I said, yeah. And she's like, how would you like to come help do that? And so over the last year or so, we've been uh, working on getting, getting that content and message out. Um, we, we do get featured in a couple of the national magazines here that get syndicated globally. Um, she speaks uh, you know, at, at national events here in the States. And so uh, yeah, and two, I, I know, look, there's always a, a pretty good contingent uh, of Aussies at, at whether it's FPA or uh, NAPFA, you know, some, some other big conferences. There's, you guys travel well, I'll, I'll say that. Yeah, it's a necessity. We're born with a passport. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Oh, man. So, like, what would you say if you could give one tip on how to be a better advisor and, and whatever that means to you, what would you like to see advisors doing more of? Oh, you, you got me there. Um, just one thing, uh, <laughs> you know, look, I, so I'll, I'll take maybe a different angle and, and coming from the, the consulting side of advisors are really great and really passionate and want to help people. And that's what's beautiful about our profession. The, the thing that gets people tripped up is as good as an advisor is at advising, a lot of advisors aren't great at managing and running a business. And for, for us to make the greatest impact, we have to not only do well with advising our clients, but we also have to do well at, at managing and running our businesses. And, and so that's, that's one of the biggest trip ups that I see with firms, uh, particularly young firms. And, you know, whether, whether young in, hey, I just left a bigger firm and I'm starting my own firm, whether young in, hey, I'm, I'm just out of school or I'm getting ready to do this. 
we want to help so bad that we become a little bit altruistic sometimes. And that's, that's not a bad thing, but running and managing the business is part of the gig. If, if you're going to do big things, which I think a lot of us want to do. And so that would be my advice is, is yes, get, get good at the advisor part but also get good at managing and running a business. You mentioned altruistic, and that is something that uh, I think a lot of advisors uh, would, would um, resonate with. Uh, I was speaking with an advisor the other day, and they were helping an individual get out of serious debt. So uh, I, I don't know the exact figures, but it was substantial. And, you know, they found this you know, method of helping um, the, their client. And the fee was, I think, about $10,000. Um, it's kind of difficult to explain without going into it. Um, but it was an interesting, a novel way to solve um, uh, debt problems, that's for sure. But anyway, this advisor knew that the client didn't have $10,000. And so looked at me genuinely and said, so I'm thinking about paying this for the client just because I'm like, I know it's going to work. And it has something to do with there's people out there that are really good at negotiating down debt. So you pay these people and they'll call all the people that, that are owed debts and they can reduce it dramatically as long as it's paid out sort of immediately. And, and it, but you know, this client was going to get out of debt in, including the fee to the person who was doing the negotiation and to pay out the debts, it was going to cost $10,000. And, and this advisor looks at me and goes, like, I'm, I think I'm just going to pay it because I know that this client can't get the money, but then they'll be completely out of debt. And I, I, I was blown away, first and foremost. I, I'm thinking there's so few professions that attract people with uh, such a big heart. Like it's not a hugely common thing to have the person, a professional who's providing a service to a client to, to offer to pay $10,000. And then, but we kind of spoke about it and I was like, look, if you do this, this, and this, you might actually be able to, you know, get a payment plan, you know, uh, with, with the person who's done the work. Uh, and you know, that's going to solve at least half the problem. And then, you know, especially if you're referring more work to the, the same person, they might be able to work with you and you might be able to guarantee it without paying it. And, like, so we kind of discussed a bunch of different options. I'm not sure if they ended up actually paying it, but it's, it's a weird thing in financial advice where even though we're, we deal with money 24 seven, yeah, advisors tend to get occasionally a little bit too emotionally attached. And that might be just simply because the job on the day to day basis is to get so vulnerable with your clients so that they end up with a better job that you end up giving a piece of yourself as well. Yeah, you, you absolutely do. And you, you don't want, you never want to lose that, right? You never, you never want to, to lose that. But, but at the same time, in, in order for us to help and to have the impact that I know so many of us want to have, we have to stay in business, you know, and, and if, if we can't stay in business, we can't have the impact. And it's, it's a little chicken and egg. I, I get it. But um you know, that's, that's a thing that I, that I just see that you, gosh, you see these folks that are amazing advisors and then you look at their business and you go, gosh, but you're not going to be able to sustain that for, for, for the long run. And, and, you know, look, some, sometimes it's, it's okay. And, and stories like that are, are what make this profession beautiful, right? Yeah, you're not wrong. Um, uh, so Brendan, thank you so much for coming on for all the people, you know, and the advisors that are out there listening, obviously you're, you're on the, the X, Y platform. I'm sure that they can reach out directly via there, but if they wanted to find you elsewhere out onto the interwebs, like how do they find out more about what you're doing, what Herbis is doing uh, and how do they get in contact with you? Yeah, for sure. So uh, if you wear Herbers and company, uh, so if you Google Herbers and Company, Angie Herbers, it's HerbersCo.com, and that's that's where we are. We've got lots of lots of good content out um, at Herbers Co. 
I think we're just on Twitter. We don't, we don't have Instagram or anything. <laughs> um, LinkedIn is, is always great as well, but yeah, so we're, we're going to be launching a, an academy, a digital academy with all of our consult. Well, I shouldn't say all a, a good portion of our consulting resources. We're going to be doing online uh, webinars, uh, quick hit workshops, things of that nature. It's going to be launching later this year. Um, and maybe, maybe we come back on in, in six, 12 months and, and re-engage on it or something. But uh, Herber's Academy will be launching. Uh, we'll also be out and about at, you know, most of the, the conferences. Um, and hey, you know what? We, we love to travel. Um, we get over to the UK quite a bit. And uh, hey, if we're going there, we might as well come to Australia, right? Oh, yes. Please do, man. And then we could do it in person. That'd be awesome. Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll try to make that happen. I won't say we will, uh, but we'll, we'll do our best to, to try to make it happen for sure. I'm pretty sure that was a promise. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. It was great to sort of connect and meet, um, you know, as, an, as, as, as I've been doing actually over the last couple of weeks, just as XY has been going a little bit international. One of the things that we never anticipated was... Um, you know, I think many, many years ago, we sort of registered the name XY Advisor and then XY Planning Network sort of started almost at the exact same time. But those guys were really well organized and uh, have really shot and done amazing stuff. So now if we're sort of, you know, slowly but surely um, going into the States and the UK and everywhere like that, I'm guessing we're eventually going to have to have a, a chat with these guys and be like, I mean, do you get X and we get Y or like, how are we going to split this up? <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, well, hey, the good news is I, I know those folks very, very well. Um, they're, they're amazing folks like yourselves, and um, I'm sure we could, we could work something out. Um, the, the, but the challenge is, you know, so now we, I, we, we would always have the conversation of, okay, it's X, Y, but now Y is getting older. So <laughs> do we add? What do we do? What do we, how do we get the, the next crowd? In? Yeah. Absolutely. It's all it's, good, good, fun, good, fun challenges to have for sure. Awesome, man. All right. Well, thank you very much again. And uh, yeah, hopefully get to meet in person sometime. Yeah. Hey, love, 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 love what you guys are doing and uh, keep it up, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Cheers, mate. All right. Take care.